Right, in this mini tutorial, we're going to think about uh, one of the most common effects of an upper motor neuron lesion, and this is um, increased tone uh, within the affected limb, the condition known as hypertonia. Um, and one manifestation of hypertonia is something called spasticity, um, which we can see in the image here, and which I'll talk about in more detail later on. Um, before we crack on, let's just remind you what we mean by muscle tone. Um, you've all got a, a sense of what normal muscle tone is. Um, if you've ever tried to passively move someone's limb whilst they're relaxed, you get very little resistance indeed. Um, in patients, say, with Parkinson's disease, where the limbs become very stiff due to rigidity, um, that's an example of increased muscle tone. Um, and ex an example of decreased muscle tone, um, for those of you who've ever held a baby, you know that babies have got very low muscle tone, um, particularly in their neck muscles, and that's why they've got these floppy heads. So a baby is a good example of someone with low muscle tone. A Parkinson's disease patient is a good example of someone with high muscle tone. Um, and spasticity is one um, manifestation of increased tone, hypertonia. Uh, and the way that we can understand um, how hypertonia comes about following upper motor neuron lesions is by looking at the monosynaptic um, reflex arc in, in a bit of detail. So let's draw this out for you. Um, it's a very simple reflex arc. As you know, you should all be incredibly familiar with the basic monosynaptic reflex arc. So here's a section through the spinal cord. Here's our central canal with our dorsal horn. And our ventral horn there. Here is our dorsal root with our dorsal root ganglion. Here is our ventral root and the dorsal and ventral roots come together as you know to form our spinal nerve. Uh, and we're going to think about you know th this could be um, any level of the cord supplying a limb which has been affected by an upper motor neuron lesion. Okay so it could be um, you know, following a stroke, something like that. So let's draw on, um, in red, our sensory neuron. Um, and this sensory neuron um, is collecting information from a muscle spindle, okay? You know about muscle spindles and how they know about the length of muscles. And this sensory neuron brings this information into the cord. There's its cell body in the dorsal root ganglia, and here comes the axon going through into the ventral horn there okay this sensory neuron then synapses upon um, a motor neuron within the ventral horn and that motor neuron sends its axon through the ventral root into the spinal nerve and ultimately to the same muscle of interest okay so when we elicit um, a spinal reflex what we do is we um, hit the tendon of the muscle, this stretches the muscle spindles, action potential goes through the sensory neuron all the way to the ventral horn where it synapses on the motor neuron, lower motor neuron, and then the action potential travels down the lower motor neuron and causes the muscle to twitch. So far so good, very straightforward. Let's add on another uh, level of detail. Um, and, and in green, here is a um, corticospinal neuron here okay which is excitatory to these lower motor neurons so this is um, an excitatory corticospinal tract neuron which has descended all the way down from the motor cortex and this is one neuron which is important for voluntary movement um, in that particular muscle okay so you decide to, to move it um, the corticospinal tract gets activated and it causes the lower motor neuron to contract now, something that you may not have realised is that actually the, most of the influences on this um, lower motor neuron are in fact inhibitory. All right? Most of the influences impinging on this lower motor neuron are in fact inhibitory. And there are a whole load of different tracts which descend through the cord and they terminate on inhibitory interneurons which inhibit 
the lower motor neuron. And there's lots and lots of different pathways that descend through the cord and their net effect is to inhibit the lower motor neuron. And if you were to look at that lower motor neuron, you would find that most of the time it is in a state of inhibition. Okay? Now, many of these descending inhibitory pathways are actually themselves controlled by the cortex, by descending cortical projections going down to, say, the reticular formation in the brainstem. And if you suffer from a cortical lesion, say a stroke, what actually happens is not only do you destroy these excitatory inputs going down through the corticospinal tract, but you also interrupt these descending inhibitory inputs. Okay? So what's the effect of this? Well, actually, initially, what the effect is on the lower motor neuron is that the lower motor neuron goes into a state of what's known as spinal shock. It effectively shuts down, and the frequency of action potentials running along this axon diminishes greatly, so that the tone in the muscle supplied by the lower motor neuron initially decreases. However, as time goes on, the lower motor neuron starts to wake up. And when it wakes up, what does it discover? Well, it discovers that... For one, it's still got the excitatory inputs coming into it from muscle spindles. It's still being stimulated by muscle spindles. However, it has lost these excitatory corticospinal projections, so we no longer have voluntary movement. But more importantly, it has lost all of these many, many descending inhibitory influences. And what that means is that we've effectively taken the brakes off of this lower motor neuron and its activity increases because it has lost these descending inhibitory influences. And therefore, it fires off more frequent action potentials leading to more frequent muscle contractions. And this is what leads to increased muscle tone. OK, so the take home message is that we have on the lower motor neuron, so the lower motor neuron has um, net inhibition normally. And if you take away that net inhibition, what you end up with is increased excitation. And that leads to increased muscle tone. Now, if we have a stroke affecting the, the upper limb, um, the flexor and extensor muscles are affected equally. So we need to explain why we get this very typical posture in a limb that's affected by spasticity. And the typical posture is um, flexed elbow, uh, flexed wrist and flexed fingers. So why do we get this? Well, actually, the explanation for this is relatively straightforward. And this is because all muscles are affected equally, both flexors and extensors. But in the upper limb, the flexors are in fact more powerful. And therefore, when hypertonia affects both flexors and extensors equally, the flexors win and we get this flexed position. So that's the very simple reason for why we get this typical flexed posture in a spastic upper limb. And it's all down to overactivity in the monosynaptic reflex arc because we've taken the brakes off of the lower motor neuron by removing the descending inhibitory influences. Okay, that's all I've got to say on this. Thank you.